couple of announcements. Um, the first one uh, has to do with the, those baby bottles you might have noticed out in the lobby. So I'm going to let Kathy go ahead and make an announcement about those. All right. Thank you, Kathy. And just very briefly, for those who might be following along on YouTube Live, maybe who couldn't make it today, um, baby bottles are in the lobby to support uh, Clarity Care, which is a wonderful organization here locally that supports women and young children and or, or mothers and young children. And so um, you can grab a baby bottle, fill it up. Uh, it has uh, other ways to give there as well uh, that you can get information from those bottles. Bring them back by Mother's Day, May 12th. All right, uh, a couple other uh, important announcements. Um, this Friday, a uh, Good Friday, March 29th, we're going to hold a Good Friday service here at the church, 7 p.m., so come and join us for uh, the Good Friday service, 7 p.m. this coming Friday. And then we will also see you for our um, celebration of Easter Sunday, so the following Sunday morning at our regular time. Uh, and, but then there's also something um, kind of peculiar the next weekend, the weekend after Easter. We will also be gathering on Friday evening at 7 o'clock for a service here in, in church. But that will actually be in lieu of our typical Sunday service because of the eclipse and just um, the crazy crowds that are going to be here in town. I'm afraid it would be hard for people to even get to church that Sunday morning. So on April 5th, which is a Friday, we will hold our service uh, uh, on that evening instead of Sunday, April 7th. So just to review again real quick, we'll see you this coming Friday at 7 p.m. for Good Friday, and then also Sunday morning for Easter, Easter uh, Sunday, and then the following Friday we'll see you here for our, our regular worship service, but we will not see you here Sunday, April 7th. All right? Uh, I'm sorry, that's confusing, I know. And of course, today is a very special day. It is Palm Sunday. Uh, it's the last Sunday in the season of Lent, and it's the beginning of what we call Holy Week. And so as we begin to worship together this, um, on this Palm Sunday, I'm just going to read a, a few brief words. And I'll, I'll begin by reading these two sentences. Uh, I'll, I'll begin by reading these couple of sentences, and then after I read each one, we can all respond together with Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Sisters and brothers in Christ, during Lent, we have been preparing for the celebration of our Lord's death and resurrection. Today we begin this solemn celebration and union with Christians throughout the world. Our Lord Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem in triumph to complete his work as our Savior 
to be rejected, to suffer and die, and to be raised from the dead. So let us go with him in faith and love, so that united with him and his sufferings, we may share his risen life. Let that be the thought that sets the tone for us as we worship, as we pray, as we learn and grow together today. Let's worship. So if you are able and would like to stand with us now, this would be a good time to stand and we will um, we'll just raise our voices and, and praise and a um, good way to start this Holy Week. Sorry, you ready? Sorry for the delay there, folks. <laughs>
can be seated if you'd like as we continue. I think that was a little longer song, so we'll sit a little early.
in our last song. We, we do have full slides for, but if you prefer the hymnal, it's, it's number 210. Jesus paid it all. And we'll do it just like the hymnal has it, and we'll repeat the chorus at the end. Well, the very last verse, we change the words just, just slightly. Um, to, um, so you'll want to look up at the last slide for the very, very last repeat of the last chorus. Jesus, we do, that is our, our prayer of thanks today, that you, you paid it all. It's amazing what you did for us, we, um, and we just thank you for giving your life um, in our stead. And Father, we um, just commit um, once again the rest of the service to you, every part. Pray for your touch on um, just the offering, and thank you for your, your many blessings to us. Thank you, for, uh, or we ask for your touch on Gretchen as she sings and Pastor John as he preaches, Lord, and we just ask that you would open our, our ears and our hearts to your, your Holy Spirit speaking to us this hour. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us just gather at this time to receive the morning tithes and offerings.
to the king i don't have much to bring my heart is torn in pieces it's my offering take me to the king truth is i'm tired options are few I'm trying to pray, but where are you? I'm all churched out, hurt and abused. I can't make what's left to do. Truth is I'm
All right. Very grateful to our praise team for leading us this morning and to Gretchen and Annette for sharing that special song with us. Amen. I really appreciated that. Excuse me for just a second. I think I need a I need a bigger pulpit. We have a bigger one back there, but we don't have I feel like we don't have a big enough stage, so it just doesn't doesn't work. That's all right. We're going to make it work. All right, brothers and sisters, will you, will you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. Let's take this moment to just, to just be in the presence of God. Breathe deeply and be reminded that God is here present with us. God's spirit is within us. God's sovereign power is all around us. Caught between joy and despair, we yearn for the fulfillment of God's desire beyond the brokenness and neediness of this life. We offer thanksgiving for God's presence with us, and we offer petitions for the transformation of the church and the world. We give thanks to you, God, for the message that you came into this world bringing the message of hope, a message of healing, a a message of reconciliation, a message of new creation. And so, Lord, we pray that any place in the world where there is hatred, that your love would overcome it. We pray that In any place in the world where there is injustice, that your righteousness and justice will overcome it. And we pray that wherever there is greed in the world, that your selfless agape love would overcome it. Lord, we think of those who are in need of healing, and we pray for healing. We pray for those who are in despair and in need of hope. We pray for hope. And we pray, Lord, that you would use us, your church, to go into the world with this this message that you have given us, this ministry of reconciliation. May your Holy Spirit guide us, correct us, empower us. Lord, you are a giver of life, a bearer of pain, and a bringer of love. Day by day, you sustain the weary with your word. You gently encourage us to place our trust in you. Awaken us, God of mercy, God of grace, to the suffering of those around us. Save us from hiding in denials that deepen the hurt. Give us grace to share one another's burdens and humble service to you and to your kingdom, which you came proclaiming. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. When he had come near Bethpage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. And they were untying the colt. Its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, 
the stones would shout out. Amen. That's Luke 19, verses 29 through 40, in case you want to uh, open up your Bibles, and I might refer back to that a time or two today. And what we've just read is Luke's rendition of, of what we call the triumphal entry. This is one of several reading, readings for this, this final Sunday of Lent, for Palm Sunday. Luke's account is one of several possible readings for Palm Sunday because the triumphal entry is uh, not, there aren't a, a ton of stories that are like this. That is, it's, it is recorded in all four of the gospel accounts. It's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And because it is recorded in all four of these Gospels, there is a tendency when we think about Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry, to sort of just conflate uh, all of the Gospel accounts in our mind. What we normally recall when we think of it is sort of a, 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 a jumbled together version of all of the Gospel accounts, though they all differ slightly. And I'm pretty grateful for that this morning, and I'll tell you why. I ordered palm branches, fresh palm branches, um, so we were going to have like real palm branches, and we could do the procession and lay the branches at the altar and, and, um, and pray that these branches would remind us of, uh, of Jesus' promise to, to uh, put an end to sin and death, to conquer those things for us. But wouldn't you know it, UPS let me down. Uh, actually, I don't know if I can really blame it on UPS. They delivered them on Friday, even though they were supposed to have been delivered on Tuesday. And then nothing, Wednesday, nothing, Thursday, nothing. Friday, the day that I take off, they were delivered. And the driver didn't leave them. But since there was no one here to receive them, took them back to their warehouse. And I tried to pick them up on Saturday. And I can't, they, they wouldn't let me do it on Saturday. So no palm branches for us today. But I'm glad that we're focused on Luke's gospel right now. Because did you know Luke's gospel actually doesn't say anything about palm branches? So that's, that's how I'm playing it off. We don't have any palm branches, but it's okay because we're in Luke's gospel and it doesn't say anything about, about palm branches. But you see how, how, um, you know, how easily these stories can get can conflated in our minds. In fact, John's gospel is the only one that says anything specifically about palm branches. Matthew's gospel just says branches. Mark's gospel says leafy branches. Luke doesn't say anything about branches. Uh, look, I mean, how many would have just kind of assumed that Luke talks about palm branches in his gospel, right? I, it's okay. I would have too if I had not just very recently been studying this subject. So that's something that's a bit peculiar about Luke's version of this account. And another thing that's a, a bit peculiar about uh, Luke's version of this account is the role that the, the crowds play in it. In the other gospel accounts, you know, we read about these crowds of people that are going behind Jesus uh, and that are going in front of him, laying down branches, etc. And they're saying things like, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Hosanna, of course, means save us. Save us from Rome, save us from tyranny, because that's the kind of Messiah that they, the people thought Jesus was. And I think Jesus did come to save us, but not in the sense that they, they understood that. But in Luke's account, there is only a, a, a brief mention of any crowds being present. It does say that there were people, just that's generically just people, laying cloaks in Jesus' path. But the ones who are shouting out... And Luke's gospel are Jesus' disciples, not just crowds of people. But it, it does say it's the whole multitude of disciples. And that makes sense because Luke does a better job than other gospel writers of reminding us that Jesus did have more disciples than just the 12. In fact, probably many more. At one point, Luke mentions 72 disciples, but I think that there were even more than that. And so these, but these people who are uh, in Luke's gospel who are, are shouting out and who are praising God are not just random crowds of people, but these are Jesus' followers. 
I bet among them were, were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Susanna and Joanna. Because Luke also does a really good job of telling us uh, that Jesus had women who were disciples as well. It wasn't all just men. And all of those women that I just named are actually specifically mentioned in Luke's gospel. So he had um, women who followed him as well, even though the men are who usually get highlighted. And I'm, so I'm sure that those, those female disciples were there at the triumphal entry. Because they were there all along. Now, we do rely on the other gospel accounts besides Luke to tell us this. But they were there at Jesus' crucifixion. And Luke tells us that they were the ones who had come to put spices on Jesus' body at the tomb. Only to discover that the tomb was empty. And they were the first ones to go and tell the other disciples of the empty tomb. Those those. Those lady disciples are such an important part of this story. Ever faithful. But I'm not going to say too much, about, uh, too much more about that part of the story. That is the part of the story where there's an empty tomb. We'll talk about that soon. But it's important for us not to forget that crucifixion comes before resurrection. There is no Easter without the cross. Now, I find it hard to read stories like this one, this triumphal entry. Because when I read this story, I know what's going to happen next. I mean, you read the story of Jesus' triumphal entry. You read about the disciples celebrating all of these deeds of power that they had witnessed. And heaping up praises upon Jesus. I mean, this is a celebration that is so exuberant, so well-deserved, so essential, that were the disciples silent, the stones would shout out. Yet within the crowd of disciples celebrating as Jesus entered Jerusalem was Judas, who would soon betray Jesus into the hands of the the chief chief priests and the, the temple police, We know that within the crowd of disciples were were those who would soon be instructed to to pray that they don't come into the time of trial there in the Mount of Olives, but they, they couldn't remain awake. They dozed off while Jesus was praying with such a weight on him that it was like his his sweat were droplets of blood. We know that one of the disciples celebrating during Jesus' triumphal entry would just a few days later deny even knowing Jesus three times. We know that that the rest of them were there. And and where many of them were while Jesus was being tried, sentenced to death, unjustly beaten, killed. Who knows where they were when that was going on. But here they are and they're celebrating. The disciples celebrating on that day, did did they not know what this entry into Jerusalem meant? Three times Jesus had told them about how he would be betrayed into human hands and and put to death. Now, I believe that, that trying to picture yourself, like to read a story like this in the gospel, and to kind of place yourself in the scene, when you read such a story, that's a, I mean, I think it's great for us to look for ways to imaginatively engage with the scripture. And that's a great way to do it, to try to place yourself in the story. Though I think it was uh, Christian educator Fred Craddock who said that this sometimes puts you in a, an uncomfortable spot. You place yourself in the story, but you can't really fully be in the story as, as experiencing it as a person would have experienced it, because you know things that you're not supposed to know. The Bible invites you into to knowing, you know, knowing things that you aren't supposed to know. Like, you know, another example would be when Jesus um, raised the, the daughter of the synagogue leader, Jairus. That's a private scene. You're not supposed to be there, but the Bible lets you into it. 
And in this case, we're here at the triumphal entry, but we know what's about to happen. We have an advantage over the other characters in the story. And so when I place myself in this story, I want to go to Judas, who betrayed Jesus, or Peter, who denied Jesus, or the rest of the disciples who spent some of their final moments with Jesus arguing over which one of them was the greatest, or who couldn't keep watch with Jesus on the Mount of Olives. And I want to say to them, what are you celebrating? Don't you know what, what you're about to do? I want to ask them, why are you celebrating? Don't you know what's about to happen to Jesus? And so knowing what's coming, I don't know, this the celebration on Palm Sunday, it, it just seems a little bit, it's poorly timed. It seems just a bit inappropriate. I remember, sorry, this is kind of a sad story, but I remember one time Gretchen and I got together with some of our friends to celebrate somebody's birthday. And to be honest, I don't even remember whose birthday we were celebrating. It may have been mine. Um, I'm not sure. But we had a good time. We shared lots of laughs. The next morning, we learned that another friend of ours who had been battling cancer had succumbed to it late the night before or, or early that morning, which, was, of course, was heartbreaking news. And admittedly, I felt guilty about the fact that we had been carrying on, celebrating, having a good time the night before, and then now we know that a another friend of ours was so close to the end of her life. And so, I don't know, all of that celebrating that we had done the night before just seemed so poorly timed, so inappropriate. But is that the lesson that we're meant to take from this story of the triumphal entry. If, if it is, is there, is there ever anything that is, it's appropriate to celebrate? There's always going to be somebody near us that's struggling through something. There's always suffering in the world. So is celebrating anything always inappropriate? I don't think that's the lesson. But I ask these kind of questions because... Again, reading stories like this sometimes makes me a little bit uncomfortable. What is the lesson for us here? What's something practical that we can take away from this story? Maybe the fact that we can place ourselves in the story, even knowing things uh, that, that other people in the story don't know, is a valuable exercise. It's... This story is a reminder for us to heed Jesus' instructions to his disciples, which they themselves couldn't heed. But he told them a couple of times in the days that follow this triumphal entry to keep watch and to pray that they may not come into the time of trial. He was telling them something big is coming and be mindful of that. Maybe this is an opportunity for us to, to, to learn and to do what the disciples couldn't. Maybe the women who were in the crowd of disciples as Jesus rode into Jerusalem on, on Palm Sunday really are the ones from whom we can take the best lesson from all of this. The scripture tells us that as Jesus rode into the city, the disciples were shouting and joyfully offering praises to God. And it was Remembering all of the deeds of power that they had witnessed thanks to Jesus that prompted this, this joy-filled and vocal celebration. They'd been touched by the power of God in Jesus Christ. And they were celebrating the fact that they had been touched by the power of Jesus Christ. Maybe this is a, a, a lesson about faith. Jesus' female disciples had been touched by the power of God. And because of that, they were there. They were there at the celebration. They were there when Jesus was handed over, tried, tortured, executed. They were there for what followed. They had experienced the power of God, and they were there. They were there on Palm Sunday for the celebration, and it didn't matter what came next. They were going to be there. Ever faithful. That's one way that I can make sense of Palm Sunday. Then again, 
perhaps I, I don't have to discover some deeper meaning in this text. There's value in simply retelling the story. Today, Palm Sunday, marks the beginning of Holy Week. And certainly there are many stories for us to reflect on this week. On, on, Monday, on Monday, Thursday, Thursday of this week, we reflect on the night of Jesus' betrayal. We remember that, that gathering where he was going to eat the, or where he did eat the Passover with his disciples. But first, he washed their feet. That same evening, he blessed the bread. He blessed the cup. He ate and drank with his disciples. The institution of the Lord's Supper. On Good Friday, we begin a time of mourning and reflection as we remember Jesus' death on the cross. On Holy Saturday, we spend the day in quiet mourning and reflection that continues from the night before. It's good for us to place ourselves within that story because on Holy Saturday, we can contemplate the darkness of a world without God in it. And then, of course, following Holy Saturday is Easter Sunday. On that day, we, we celebrate what comes next. But for now, we remember that there is no Easter without the cross. There's value in being reminded of these stories and placing ourselves within them. These stories are all part of an even bigger narrative of a world full of suffering, pain, death, violence, greed, and justice, but also a story of a God who is love and who cares enough to take on that suffering, to enter into the world alongside each of us and to bring into it a living message of hope, healing, reconciliation, and love. On, on Palm Sunday, the disciples recalled all of the deeds of power they'd witnessed in Jesus, and it didn't matter what was about to happen. They praised God joyfully. If they'd been quiet, the stones would have shouted out. That bigger story of, of God who entered the suffering of the world with a message of hope, healing, reconciliation, and love is a story worth celebrating, no matter what may come. It's a story of, this is, the story of Palm Sunday is a story of faith. If we are quiet, not only will the stones shout out, all of creation will celebrate this good news. Because this is a story that carries a message of hope and healing for all of creation. And it's my prayer then that whatever, that, that wherever you are this holy week, whatever season you may be in in your life, whether it is characterized more by celebration or suffering, that you can locate yourself within that larger story of hope, healing, reconciliation, and love. Because of that story, whatever may come, we can remain faithful. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builder rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice 
and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Let's pray. God of the living, through baptism, we pass, we pass from the shadow of death to the light of the resurrection. Remain with us, God. Give us hope. Give us hope that rejoicing in the gift of the Spirit, who gives life to our mortal flesh, we may be clothed with the garment of immortality through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, by your Holy Spirit, touch us. Touch our hearts. Touch our minds. Touch our imaginations. Place us within that, that larger story. Or, or help us to, to see where we fit in within that, that picture of a world that does have suffering and death and injustice in it. But that also has a God within it, living with a message of hope, healing, and reconciliation. Lord, we just pray that in this week that comes, uh, that's coming, as we remember all of these, these important stories, that you would help us see how they fit into that bigger picture and give us faith to remain with you, whatever may come. And it's in your blessed, precious name that we pray, Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, it's been, a, it's been a pleasure to be here with all of you this week. Um, just a reminder that on, on Good Friday, um, this coming Friday, we'll meet here at 7 p.m. for a Friday service, uh, a Good Friday service. And that's something I haven't done since I've been the pastor of this church, so it's a, something new, a little different. Um, just a, a word of preparation, a Good Friday service is not like a typical worship service. Um, there's a lot of, of time in the service where we, we just remain silent. Um, a lot of times uh, the, the service is more somber in tone because it fits, you know, we know what happens on Good Friday, right? The name Good Friday is a little bit misleading. But um, it's also a, just a really sweet and worshipful time. So I hope to see you all at 7 o'clock this Sunday. On uh, Maundy Thursday, I'll, p I'll post some suggested readings on our Facebook page to help lead us through um, this Holy Week as well. And so um, I'm just looking forward to celebrating this, this important week with all of you. And of course, looking forward to selling, celebrating what comes next with all of you next week. All right. Until then, brothers and sisters, go with the grace and peace of Jesus Christ. Amen. You're, just, you're dismissed. God bless. Mm -hmm.